Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the, the October webinar series for WHY Wellbeing, Health, and Youth. I'm Kate Steinbeck, and I'll be chairing this session. Before I introduce you to our fabulous speaker, I'd first like to acknowledge all the universities that have been involved in our Centre of Research Excellence from, this, from which this webinar grows. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia, where, wherever you are, and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and cultures. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also want to welcome you as WHY members of the community of practice. Um, I encourage anyone who's not signed up to be part of us to do that. And as we, we are developing a very active and interactive community of practice around adolescent health, and this is led in partnership with our Western Sydney University collaborators and with the wonderful WHY Y Commission of Young People trained in research. Um, a few things. Um, your microphone is muted as long as we're presenting. If you have, and, so, and your video is also switched off, I want to remind you that if you have something to say or a question to ask, please use the chat on the right hand side. And if you want to comment to anything in the chat, you can go down to the little plus sign where you can type in your message. I'll be, or I'll be running the question and answer session after our fabulous guest has presented. And I would love to, I'd love to welcome Professor Rebecca Ivers. Um, she and I have worked together for quite a while on uh, adolescent research. And Rebecca is an NHMRC Senior Research Fellow and Head of the School of Population Health at the University of New South Wales and also an honorary professorial fellow at the George Institute for Global Health. Rebecca leads a vast global research program focusing on the prevention and management of injury. And clearly that's what she's going to be talking to you about today and remind you that uh, unintentional injury is one of the major causes of morbidity and um, mortality in adolescence. Rebecca, welcome. Thanks very much, Kate, and it's lovely to be here. And, and I too would like to acknowledge that we're all meeting on unceded lands of Aboriginal people and uh, across the country. And I'm here coming to you today from Gadigal, Wongal country. So it's great to be here um, and to talk to you all about injury. Um, some of this is going to be a bit of an injury 101, just to remind you all about injury, the burden of injury. Um, but first of all, what I want to do is just talk to you a little bit about myself. Who am I? What's my standpoint? I'm a non-Aboriginal woman. Um, I grew up in Sydney. Firstly, trained, believe it or not, as an optometrist. And my first career was actually as an optometrist working in Northern Territory, where I got a pretty quick induction into um, inequities in health systems, working um, around eye care in remote parts of Northern Territory. And I had the great privilege of working with um, wonderful Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory in um, remote community controlled health services and the Northern Territory Aboriginal Eye Health Committee. Um, so I got a pretty quick, um, I guess, developed pretty quickly an understanding about the inequities and the inadequacies of our health system. So I decided to go and retrain in public health um, and did my master's in public health and PhD at the University of Sydney. Um, and my PhD was in fact on injury. So if you're wondering how you get from optometry to injury, my PhD was on the relationship between poor vision falls and hip fractures in old people. And I went onwards. Um, so that, that's my story. Um, I, as Kate said, I'm now at UNSW, um, head of the School of Population Health and working across a whole range of projects in unintentional injury. Um, my program of research is really looks at injury across the life course, um, children and adolescents and ageing. Um, I also work on projects around cultural safety in healthcare. 
but much of my work has got to focus on where the gain will be greatest um, and looking at marginalised and underserved populations because that is generally where the burden is and that's where our impact can be greatest when we're talking about changing lives and improving health, which really is always the focus of my work and I'm sure all of yours as well. Um, I do a lot of work. We have big cohort studies and trials um, and co-design processes and implementation science really underpins most of the work that we do. And, um, you know, I think we have a lot of challenges in the work that we do because of the people that um, I, I work with and the challenges in conducting research in poorly resourced settings, but often the gains are going to be greatest. I'm also involved um, in three um, centres of research ex excellence, three NHMRC centres of research excellence in adolescent health. Um, with this CRE that's associated with this seminar series, um, with CRE REACH, um, which is Aboriginal Child and Adolescent Health with a focus on capacity development, and a CRE with George Patton and Susan Sawyer and another group of, you know, wonderful investigators on global investment in adolescent health. So I'm very privileged to have the opportunity to work with so many and such diverse groups of people and, and of course, um, always learning, um, always hearing different ways of doing things and learning and understanding um, about my own biases and privileges and trying to um, move forwards in a way that is appropriate. So some of the studies that we're involved in, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of them today, Drive, our Young Driver study, um, worked with Kate on Archer, Rural Adolescent Cohort Study, um, the Next Generation study, which is the NH and another, they're all NH and MRC studies actually. Um, it's an Aboriginal uh, adolescent cohort study led by Sandra Eads and then RAIN, um, a, a, the RAIN cohort um, uh, with Jan Marino and Rachel Skinner, which is looking at risky behaviour in the RAIN cohort study. Um, and I'm also involved in a few other studies in adolescent health, a, a cluster randomised control trial of the PACS Good Behaviour Game in New South Wales schools led by Michelle Tye at the Black Dog Institute. And we, in fact, have a PhD student funded by the YCRE um, uh, working on that. And, and again, that's a really great piece of implementation science um, research in action. Um, also, I'm working with um, a group of people at Walgett Aboriginal Medical Service, the Gunamu Play Group, um, and this is a program which is a co-design uh, and feasibility of a child injury prevention program for Aboriginal children in Walgett. Um, Another NHMRC funded project which has ended but we're still um, pumping papers out, Burns in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and for that one I'm really proud to say that we've actually had uh, many publications from that but four PhD students um, have been um, working on this study. All of them have submitted, three of them have already been confirmed, one has just submitted and three of those four PhD students are um, Aboriginal women and a really talented bunch of Aboriginal women I have ever had been privileged to work with. So, um, you know, that's been a fantastic experience. And then also work on driver licensing support programs in Aboriginal people. And I'll talk a little bit about that project today. So we come back to injury 101. What, what is an injury? Just to remind you, it's a damage to a person caused by an acute transfer of energy or a sudden absence of heat or oxygen which takes the body beyond its bounds of resilience, various type, types of injury. But, of course, injury is not just the physical harm. It's also the psychological, spiritual, emotional and cultural aspects of harm um, that we ought to consider. So prevention doesn't only need to focus on reduced hospital bed days or lives lost, the mortality or the um, uh, disability-adjusted life year, but also the safety and emotional well-being of individuals, and that should always be our focus. We grade, we look at injuries and we always classify injuries into unintentional and intentional. Um, unintentional being road traffic injuries, falls, poisoning, drowning, burns and so on. And then intentional, self-inflicted, self-harm, interpersonal violence, war related and other. Um, so when we, when we look at injury and again remembering injury is a little bit different from most other health conditions when you're actually thinking about prevention you really do need to understand about the context of injury so we have special uh coding in 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 um icd codes we code injuries obviously by intent whether they're intentional or unintentional by type so obviously fractures open wounds burns traumatic head injuries organ injury and so on but we also actually need to um, we need to classify injuries by how they occurred by external cause. So whether it was a cutting or a piercing, a drowning, a fall, 
a fire, a fire flame or a hot object or transportation injuries and also by what people were doing at the time of injury because if we hope to prevent injury, we really do need to understand a little bit more about the context. So coming back to adolescence, why is it important? Well, we all know that you're here because you understand about adolescence. It's a critical period. It sets the scene for patterns of growth, development and behaviour that will influence health and wellbeing for the rest of life. And of course, the population of people aged 10 to 24 is currently the biggest ever, 1.8 billion in 2016. So what happens when we're thinking about injury during the adolescent years? Well, of course, we know people are growing independence, shifting roles, and you begin independent travel. So young people are more likely to their pedestrians out on their own, catching public transport, cycling, riding motorbikes and cars. And then we have that whole issue of inexperienced drivers. Um, there are changes in cognitive function and development. Um, there's time for identity formation, discovery and testing boundaries. And this can involve risk taking, rule breaking and peer pressure, which combined with um, access to driving and motorcycles and, you know, different independent behaviours that can lead to increased risk of injury and also engagement with alcohol and other drugs um, and distractions while driving. So it's no surprise that we see injury rates rise during adolescence. Coming back to the burden of injury, just thinking about what the global burden of injury, it's a big deal. So injury in 2017 was 8% of all deaths and 10% of the global burden of disease. 4.5 million injury deaths every year and 521 million cases of non-fatal injury, um, which is an increase um, from 1990. Globally, the major causes of injury deaths are road injury, self-harm, falls and interpersonal violence. Um, and really from the time that you can, we can move or we can crawl, injury death rates are twice as high in men than in women. And that's pretty consistent across all injuries at all stages. As soon as you can start crawling, men, uh, males are over, overrepresented. The only differences where we see women overrepresented are burns, um, in, and particularly in South India, in young women. Um, and that's related to homicide, um, some self-harm, but there's a lot of violence related um, and, and in terms of un there are some unintentional cooking injuries and also um, uh, intentional injury um, and also falls in older people where women, again, are, uh, can be overrepresented. When, when it comes to the global burden of injury, though, years of life lost are responsible for the majority of the injury disability adjusted life years. And that's because most injuries, um, because a lot of the injuries are young people who lose then a lot of years of life if they're killed. And the greatest contributors are road injury, falls and self-harm, again, interpersonal violence and drowning. We have seen over the last uh, 30 years, age standardised rates of the years of life lived with disability and years of life loss from injuries decline, um, but while the incidence stays about the same. We also see for many causes of injury that it, 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 it decreases with increasing socio-democratic index. So if you have a look here, you can see years of life loss on the left, years of life lived with disability on the right. Um, you can see here, this is road, um, uh, other transport injuries and road injuries, the red one, you can see that as social um, as social demographic index um, goes up, that the incidence of road injury goes down. And that's pretty much what we see, you can see for falls, that's not the case. And again, that's because falls are predominantly um, injuries that occur in high income settings um, or in wealthy, wealthy populations, older people falling, for example. When we look at how injury patterns change over time, this is just an example from the US from 2017. And you can see that it shifts um, from children all the way through um, to 2024. You can see the rise in unintentional injuries. Um, over time as young people get older. And you can also see suicide changing as well. This is another example. Um, you can also see across the life course, you can see, and again, this is um, US data where you can see very high rates of poisoning. Um, and, and, and again, that is poisoning. Um, uh, you're thinking about opioid deaths and um, unintentional drug deaths as well that are included in that. But here you'll see motor vehicle deaths. You can see as people become more independent, road deaths go up really dramatically in those early years, drop a bit and then rise a bit and then drop down again to older age. And this one here is falls, which you can see predominantly in older age. 
Um, just to cut across the world again, the injury death rate for children 0 to 19, and this cuts across WHO regions, um, you can see um, you can see road injuries um, up the top here, self-harm and interpersonal violence and other unintentional injuries. And you can see um, this is a European region. This big red bit here during to um, self-harm and interpersonal violence, a lot of that is around thinking of the conflict that's been in that region in the Middle East. Um, so that that's you know really highlighting. You can see similarly in Latin America where you see that big red blob in the middle as well. But it does show you this overwhelming burden of unintentional injuries, road injury and other in unintentional injuries down the bottom in blue across the whole globe. And again, this is causes of death for children between 5 and 14. For the world, you can see leading causes of death, um, road accidents, drowning, and then you see homicide, suicide, and fire down here as well. So really right up there at the top is leading cause of death and disability for children and young people globally. Um, so major, major issue. This again highlights the inequities. This will show you as well the overrepresentation of males here on the left compared to women on the right. Um, and you can see with global drowning burden, you can see very, very young ages, it's very high, but it's still very high all the way across the adolescent years. But you see that overrepresentation of males compared to females, and again, drowning very much so in the countries of South, Southeast Asia. So coming back to Australia, um, what do we know about injury? Um, in Australia, um, from 27 to 2019, 73% of all deaths for young people aged 15 to 24. And unintentional deaths, injury deaths, accounted for 32% of all deaths and 43% of all injury deaths. So unintentional injury is a big is a big problem. And I know um, intentional injury is also a problem for adolescents in Australia, but I'm really going to concentrate on unintentional injury here. So the most common causes were transport. So, you know, land transport, uh, driving cars, motorbikes, pedestrians, um, poisoning, um, again, and that includes drug deaths um, and drowning. Um, and again, you might be surprised to see that drowning is so high. You've got to remember that these are deaths. So these are injuries that have got high lethality um, and, and that cause death. And, and what we saw again in the trends is that unintentional injury deaths declined, but hospitalised cases were stable. So we're getting better at preventing deaths, but we're seeing still a large burden of people ending up in hospital, and that's something that we really need to keep tackling. Again, this is just showing you the overrepresentation of males compared to females from the younger to the older ages during adolescence, and you can see there's a huge discrepancy between males and females um, across these years. So it really is very much a very gendered issue. Um, and, I, and I'm sorry I don't have much data. I will come to this for gender diverse populations. Much of our data is coded very much using males and females. And we have severe inadequacies with our data collections that we're very much unable to actually look at gender diverse populations in our routinely collected data sets because of a lack of data collection in those data sets. When we look at um, leading causes of unintentional deaths, again, it's traffic crashes, poisoning and accidental drowning. And you can see here just the proportion. So again, that really big burden of um, land transport um, deaths here as well. Just again, just to sort of highlight um, where the biggest burden is, 60% um, compared to 20% for poisoning and drowning, 8%. So really traffic crashes really are a huge burden. We have seen over time, though, that on the motor vehicle injury deaths among young people have been going down, and that really was the case um, in line with the rest of the community. So our road traffic deaths have been coming down in Australia, but then they've all pretty much plateaued. And for young people, that's the same as you can see here. You can see males overrepresented here, um, and you can see, um, you know, really that but that and that overrepresentation hasn't shifted. So we still see that compared to the rest of the population, road deaths in young people are really a substantial issue, even though they have they have come down. Um, so we do still need um, to actually look at what we can do to prevent deaths in on the road with with young people. When you when we come to look at hospitalised injury for young people as well, again similarly, fourteen percent of all hospitalisations that was the top reason for hospitalisation for men and for and for women. Men 
males 2.3 times as likely to be hospitalised for unintentional injuries as women. And the top injuries, again, land transport crashes, and that's road crashes, um, inanimate mechanical injuries. And these are pretty much workplace injuries. So if you wonder, I mean, I know we use the most dreadful terminology, but these are pretty much where you're struck by. So if you're on a construction site, you're hit by some machinery, that's the kind of injury. Now, this is a big deal. Workplace injuries, 21%. And then the third one is falls. So these could be sporting falls due to collision with or pushing, falls due to roller skates, skateboards, falls due to slipping or tripping, and that's 19%. So again, um, high, you know, these are the high causes of hospitalisation for unintentional injury. So you can see um, here that we do have inequity in, in these injury rates. So both for the deaths on the left-hand side, and the hospitalised injury cases, you can see that all young people here in Orange, you can see um, people born in Australia have got higher rates than people born in overseas for, for deaths. Um, and that's basically because people, when people come to Australia, they don't engage and it takes them a while to actually come to terms with the behaviours that um, other Australians engage in. And I'll, we do have a bit of result. I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about some results from the drive study on that. But you can see here um, the injury death rates go up um, by remoteness, so compared to major cities, much higher death rates in rural and remote places, um, and socioeconomic status, much higher for lower than higher. Um, and for major cities, again, for hospitalisation, it is a lot higher. So the difference by gender, there's a great question there, really hard to explain. Um, and, and I think it probably is a whole lot of gender normative behaviour. There's probably de developmental things, whether there's um, other, other rationales for that, we, d we don't really know. But there, it's a really good question and it's something that, um, you know, I think it's, it's really we do need to pay more attention to that. At the moment, though, what we do need to understand that it is very, it is very gendered behaviour. <laughs> Let's let's come back to sport injury though, and again, this is a this is a big burden as well in Australia. So, um, thirty one percent of unintentional hospitalised cases. It's got the highest injury rate for all ages, and again, a three times higher rate for males and females, and it's higher for young males than older males. So younger males tend to get injured more than older males. And I guess that's something to do with risk taking behaviour and pushing the boundaries and peer pressure. Interestingly, for both males and females, the most common cause is actually are actually football codes. Um, and, you know, again, it says something about the way in which we play sport and I guess the rules around um, football codes. But what's interesting was also is that motorcycling, basketball, cycling and skateboarding, I mean, I, I guess not surprisingly, considering the kind of danger involved in many of those activities, I guess basketball is probably knee injuries. Um, but I think it's worth noting that motorcycling for young males was the second most common hospitalised sport injury and cycling was the third. And it's always surprising. Um, it surprises people. Um, but again, motorcycling does have a high high risk attached to it. Um, and because, and especially for young people, because you've got young people whose risk behaviour may not yet be moderated by age, um, you know, basically potentially riding a vehicle which has got very high, high power um, and may not be wearing appropriate um, protective clothing, which may or may not protect you in any case if you're travelling fast enough. So we often see that, that you just see this very high burden from motorcycling, both in high and low income countries. So um, uh, there's a question about motorcycle injuries counted as sport. It's actually pretty tricky, the coding. Um, motorcycle injuries, when we, we, we actually classify sport differently, so the codes are pulled from a range of different codes. Um, so um, it's, it's counted. Motorcycle injuries are actually counted as road traffic injuries. Um, so some of the other people that we need to be thinking about are Aboriginal, young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now, what we do know, and again, this comes from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Adolescent um, and Youth Health um, and Wellbeing Report that was done by AHW in 2018, which I had the privilege of being on the advisory committee for, we know many young Aboriginal people are in excellent health, have falling mortality rates and are closely connected to culture. We also know, though, that young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people face additional barriers to making a successful transition to adulthood because of the impact of intergenerational trauma um, and the racism and the socioeconomic disadvantage that they may um, that they may suffer, um, or they you know that is part of their lives. And and so we do see um, leading contributors to the disease burden around suicide and self inflicted injuries 
anxiety disorders, alcohol use disorders and, and road traffic crashes. And injury is responsible for most deaths of young Aboriginal people, including suicide, land transport um, crashes and assaults. Um, so again, um, a population that requires, um, you know, absolutely special targeted programs and policies and a voice, a strong voice um, in, in, in what actually happens and how injury is addressed and how it's treated. Another group um, about which we know much less are um, gender diverse populations. And as I said earlier, um, we don't have good data collections. I think recently we saw that in the census. Um, and, and many young gender diverse people live very healthy and fulfilled lives, but a disproportionate number experience poorer mental health comes and have higher risk of suicidal behaviours than their peers. And of course, we see challenges with stigmatisation, prejudice and access to appropriate health care. There's actually very little evidence on unintentional injury. The bigger issues seem to be in intentional injury and, and violence and, and, and mental health. Um, but as I said, we have challenges in the data collections and this is a bit of an unknown area. So when we come back to talking about prevention of injury, um, what's really important, we understand a lot about injury risk factors and the social determinants. We know that injuries are higher in low and middle income countries and high income countries. We know that even within high income countries, there's a bi-directional relationship between injury and poverty. Um, uh, if you're poor and you live in a worse environment, you're going to have higher rates of injuries. We know the environment is a contributor, the conditions of roads you drive on, your laws and the enforcement, the housing that you live in, child labour and poor walking, working conditions, all of those things contribute to higher injury rates in resource poor settings and within high income countries. And as I said, within gender, injury rates are higher in males. So when we start talking about prevention, it's critically important that we focus on all of these um, social determinants and risk factors to make sure that we're actually addressing the right things. Injury is not equitably distributed and we see that across the US, New Zealand and the UK where we see persistent socioeconomic inequalities. What's the two areas where we don't see that same bi-directional relationship are in fact sporting injury and you see a higher preponderance of sporting injuries in higher income and again I think with young people and likely because um, people who are more well off are probably more inclined to actually enrol children in sporting activities and also in falls in older people. Um, we have we, that socioeconomic divide disappears. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done and just highlighting this um, in driving related injuries in young people. The DRIVE study was an NH and MRC funded cohort study. My first postdoctoral project actually, my supervisor Robin Norton um, got funded for this project, uh, 20,000, we had to en enrol over 20,000 young people in this cohort study looking at young drivers. So we completed, they completed a baseline survey and gave consent to linkage to crash offence, hospitalisation and death data. And uh, in fact, it was an incredible challenge because it was the first uh, share all the data linkage um, unit project and we use mainly online consent so people did the survey mainly online I think it was 90% of people completed this online and gave online consent for later data data linkage and we linked the data after two years and 13 years to police reported crash offence hospitalisation and death data um, so what do we see after two years um, Two years later? So we enrolled people 17 to 24 years on their red P plate. So they just got their driver's licence within the last 12 months. And we asked lots of questions about things like um, risky driving, risk perception, supervised driving experience, mental health, drug and alcohol use. We used alcohol, we used Audit C, we had Kessler 10, we used the um, Beck suicide inventory STEM question, which is about self-harm in the last 12 months. What we found was that if people reported high scores on risky driving scales, two years later they had a 50% increased risk of crash and that's adjusting for all the other usual confounders that you'd expect. People who reported self-harm behaviours in the previous 12 months had an increased risk of crash. If you lived in regional remote areas, you're more likely to have um, serious crashes, single vehicle versus multiple vehicle, um, and you're more likely to have injury versus non-injury crashes. And of course, we also saw that drivers of lower socioeconomic status had a higher risk of crash-related hospitalisation. <laughs> 
We also um, saw that there were some factors associated with decreased risk of crash. Asian-born young drivers had a 50% reduction. So the longer they'd lived in Australia, the more the crash rate came back to what the Australian norm was. But when people first came to Australia, for young Asian people, um, if, they, if you were born in Hong Kong and came to Australia and got your driver's licence, you actually had a lower risk of crash than Australian-born. Um, we also found that people who had done a particular type of resilience-based school education program, which was risk up on the Northern Rivers, those people had a 44% reduced risk of crash um, compared to a, a one-day driver-focused program, which was really prevalent across the rest of the state. Um, we did find that drivers living in rural and remote areas had a 50% reduced risk of crash, but that was actually just risk of crash. They were more likely to have been involved in serious crashes um, it was just more that if you live in an urban area, you've got a higher rate risk of crashing because you've got more cars to crash into you. But your crashes tend to be more trivial and not, not as serious as they are if you're in a country area. After, um, after um, and we also found that if you, su if you had a supervisor um, who had offences, so when you were learning to drive, if your supervisory driver had driving offences, you were more likely to crash. Um, and, and again, you share characteristics with your parents as well. So that's really not surprising. Um, for those of you who've got young people, or if you're going for a driver's test, I can also tell you that the driving tests work pretty well. So if you fail your driving test a number of times or your hazard perception test, you've actually got a higher risk of crash. So the tests that we use are actually pretty good at screening out drivers who aren't very good or need a bit more experience. Um, so when we did the 13 year linkage really confirmed a lot of those if you're from a low ses area baseline you still have got an increased risk of crash um, and drivers with offenses at baseline have got an increased risk of crash so if you are driving badly and being all being picked up by the police at baseline increased risk of crash and we also saw a sustained impact of risky driving behavior so if you if you show if you said to us you know, in 2003 and four, that you engaged in a range of different risky driving behaviours like hooning or driving fast, habitual speeding, you actually had a sustained crash risk 13 years later. So that's sort of suggesting that people aren't growing. There are a group of people that actually aren't growing out of these risk-taking behaviours um, and that there's other factors at play. And we, again, also saw that the resilience-based program um, participants were still less likely to have any crash. So what's a hypothesised mechanism? Well, of course, you know, compared when you're a driver, I mean, when you think about socioeconomic status and injury, if you're poor, if you're from a low income, you're driving on poor quality roads, poor quality infrastructure, your parental influence may be different. Um, you may have le less access to emergency services and emergency healthcare. You're more likely to live in out of regional areas um, when, you, when you're driving. So it's really not surprising that you've got different susceptibility, different differential exposure, and then you've got a higher risk of injury. But it's really important that when we target our programs that we make sure we take all of these things into account when we when we're talking about prevention when 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 we look at prevention for injury the sort of traditional injury prevention models are the three e's education and behavior change legislation and enforcement engineering and technology so engineering technology better roads better cars um, legislation and enforcement, you know, speeding laws, drink driving laws, graduated driver licensing laws and enforcement, all accompanied by appropriate education, social marketing and, and behaviour change. So that's been pretty much the standard for injury prevention for many, many years. And it has been very effective. So if you start thinking about all the different types of injury that these things apply to, consumer product safety, hot water mixes to prevent scalds in the household, all the different road traffic injury laws that we have, you can see that it's worked pretty well. But injury is a multi-sexual problem that requires a multi-sexual approach to prevention. Um, if you think about it, again, it's different from many other, other health problems in that when we address injury, we need to actually have collaboration from people working across health. Health often actually treats the outcomes of injury but doesn't necessarily have a big role to play in, in prevention. But we do work with sectors in education, in transportation, in housing, sporting clubs, um, the environment, um, people who design the urban environment um, and do urban planning and workplaces and workplace regulation and so on. And of course, community members and NGOs. And indeed, a lot of injury prevention 
some done by government, but it's a lot is done by NGOs. You think of all the NGOs that you can think of, Royal Life Saving, Kids Safe, and there's a whole lot of other NGOs out there who are really actually um, designing, implementing um, injury prevention campaigns in the community. This is also a classic case uh, approach that we use for injury prevention, the Heavens Matrix, and it really just identifies ways in which you can prevent injury, cutting across the phase, um, and this is one for road traffic injury, um, pre-crash. So you can see, you think of all the different things that you might do before the crash, during the crash and post-crash, and the factors that you need to include, the human, vehicles and equipment, and the environment. And you can see that there's a range of different things um, cutting across crash prevention, injury prevention during the crash, which might be use of the seatbelts, um, and life-staining um, inter interventions, which are more about hospital care. Now, that's all very well, but that doesn't take into account the social environment. And what we do understand in injury is that because there's such a wide range of um, risk factors, both structural and individual, and complex interactions between all of those things, we need upstream systems-based approaches that address these issues across the disease groups and strengthen the health systems. Um, and they're much more likely to be effective, especially in remote or resource poor settings um, where you have, you might have limitations in prevention, preventative programs and health services. So it's really important that we take all these things into account. And this is another version of the Haddon's matrix, which is a little bit more up to date. So we cut, you can see that we still cut across the pre-event event and post event and the different agents. So whether it's the vehicle, the physical environment and the social environment, I mean, you can see here, all these other decision criteria come in around equity, stigmatization, preferences, feasibility, cost and effectiveness. And we need to take all of these things into account um, when we're designing injury prevention approaches. It's more of a systems thinking approach compared to this reductionist approach on the left hand side. So if you're thinking about for road traffic injury and you think you might think about that for drug affected drivers, which again is an increasing problem. Um, a reductionist approach just says, all right, well, they're a problem, we've got to get off the road, so we'll have enforcement, um, pick up drivers under the influence, and that'll reduce crashes and fatalities. Whereas the reality is we know there needs to be a much more sophisticated approach on the right-hand side here um, and involving much more. And I would actually even take it up to the next level and actually look at, um, you know, social determinants feeding into that around uh, drug use um, and, and also access to transport for people. So what I'm going to do now just before we finish is just talk a little bit about driving change. And this is an approach, this is some research that we did in partnership with uh, multiple Aboriginal communities across New South Wales looking at driver licensing in young Aboriginal people. It's an action, I guess it was participatory reaction research um, where we co-designed a program and implemented and, and now in fact it's led to statewide funding of similar programs across New South Wales, so really successful in terms of impact. Um, this program came about um, largely, we did some pilot work in Burke at the Aboriginal Medical Service and did a study um, with people attending Aboriginal medical services across a range of different um, locations in New South Wales. And really what happened, um, and that was to look at road safety. We um, had been, there were real gaps in understanding about road safety and injury in, in Aboriginal people because uh, our crash data doesn't collect Indigenous status well. What happened though when we did that is that people said, well, actually the big issue is in fact not so much road safety, but it's actually licensing. Licensing rates are really low. Um, there, we found really strong links between licensing, employment and education in that study. So if you had a driver's licence, you were four times, um, you had four times the odds of being in employment or having a degree qualification um, compared to those who didn't have a licence. Um, and there were really uh, similar findings from other studies across the country, including some of the work that we did for the Northern Territory Government. So putting aside, um, and again, many people had said, and this uh, comes from work that Yvonne Helps and James Harrison and Elena Kickbush had done in South Australia many years ago, showing that a driver's licence is much more around road safety. So we can see that young people really, are, are, you know, want their driver's licence for independence um, and for Aboriginal people even more important, particularly if you're living in rural and remote places with that good access to public transport. It's about autonomy, mobility and access. Unfortunately for young people, it also comes with an increased risk of fatal crash and injury. So 
We, we heard um, many stories from young people and older people about barriers to driver licensing, finance, identification documents, poor access to drivers and appropriate vehicles for learners. So many young people had parents who weren't drivers or didn't have a car who might have been had difficulty um, with uh, literacy or numeracy and getting through the learner knowledge system. And then also um, issues with fines um, and excessive contact with the justice system, which meant they were barred from getting a driver's licence and, of course, a lack of culturally responsive service provision. So the program was put together and this is funded um, with funding from AstraZeneca from and, and from several grants from the Transport in New South Wales and also from New South Wales Health. Um, but it was set up as a case management approach with a young Aboriginal person or an Aboriginal person um, with strong links to the local community sitting in a local community organisation that was accessible, not a health, not necessarily a health service, often a lands council or a youth, uh, a youth service, and supported by the local community or key stakeholders. And they basically case managed people through the driver licensing system. We um, had they had access to cars, so they could provide people with supervised driving practice and coordinate. Um, activities like get, you know removing debt, um, giving people and case managing people through getting a license, getting your ID um, documents. So um, throughout the program, I mean, lots of people got a license. Um, nearly two hundred and twenty-four got a full license, um, and lots of financial assistance um, and lots of supervising driving and lots of um, community members engaged in the process. And what we found, again, very highly acceptable um, and accessible, but also that they were, again, more likely to get, um, uh, more likely to find employment or have a change of employment 12 months later. And the number of people in those communities um, increased um, in, in those places. But more importantly, the program is now funded. Um, across the state and has led to sort of uh, similar programs in other states and a real focus on local ownership, you know, Aboriginal leadership and very much, um, and this was a, a program that was very much led by the young Aboriginal people and Aboriginal people in the communities in which it was run. And here's just some pictures from it. We also had a really um, engaged steering committee as well for the study um, of uh, and a number of politicians, um, but and the police were actually sitting at had meetings um, quarterly around the project. So when in fact the project, as well as the Aboriginal community organisations, when the project finished and we had results, it was very easy to turn it into policy because they'd been engaged along the whole way, which was really important and obviously really well regarded by the community. And in fact, I was talking to one of the community organisations this week, just been refunded to deliver the program for another couple of years. And they're still saying that in their regional town, young people are still getting their licence and it's just been an incredibly successful program. Um, so, you know, fantastic way. But again, this is a kind of holistic program that will address injury um, and injury rates, but again, also address social determinants and a cut across a whole lot of the other issues that young, young people are facing in community settings. And I am a big fan of having these, I call them horizontal programs, which not just siloed programs, and it's very easy in injury to come back and go, I'm just going to do a road safety program or a poisoning program. If you actually want to see sustained change, we need programs that are going to cut across a range of different health conditions and, 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 and factors. So um, injury, we do, injury is a national priority. Hard to believe. It's been a national priority for a long time and we've had national injury plans, but they've never actually had action plans assigned to them. And there are various state-related action plans and, and, and programs, but we really do have struggled for a long time as um, really getting national action and coordinated action. And we really would love to see a CDC-style organisation that develops and implements plans nationally. Um, we've just been involved in putting together the last uh, next national injury prevention strategy. Kate Hunter at the George Institute led that and I was on the advisory committee. Um, again, it hasn't quite been launched and I think we need, um, we definitely need an action plan that's funded alongside it and that's always going to be the challenge with these kind of things. But what this strategy aims to do is to look at self-harm. Um, but also road-related injury, workplace injuries, sport injuries, but also really importantly prioritise the availability of and access to culturally appropriate programs and services for, um, for young people. So these, these are the strategy aims for young people. And you can see, again, the kind of things, reducing road traffic injuries, so strengthening graduated driver licensing systems, which really are the cornerstone of our um, approaches to reducing young driver injuries, but also, again, supporting driver licensing programs like Driving Change, um, and people experiencing socioeconomic disadvantage and those living in rural and remote areas. Workplace injuries, 
sport injuries um, and, and the culturally um, sensitive services. So a lot of really great recommendations. I think what we know is that this is going to take time and money and a lot of um, commitment from government. So I think we're going to need to do a lot of advocacy going forward to make sure that these are in fact, um, you know, funded. So there are a lot of gaps that are identified in the strategy. So we don't know much about effective interventions to reduce poisoning, overdose and drowning among young people, um, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, I would just like to give a shout out to Amy Peden, one of the um, lecturers in our school in population health. He's just got an investigative grant to look at drowning in adolescents. Um, we do need more evidence on workplace injury burden and causes, including with young Aboriginal people. Um, the cost of acquired brain and spinal cord injuries um, and, and, and programs around legislative environment me environmental measures to reduce violence, um, at road trauma associated with other drugs um, and violence against women and girls. So a lot of, lot of work to do. I, and I hope, you know, I hope some of you are enthusiastic about getting involved in some of this. And of course, I would love to um, see some of you get engaged um, and, you know, come and come and work with us on some of these, because it really is, it's an exciting area to work in because it's multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral, it is always challenging. Because a lot of the interventions are legislative, we are always working with government and we are always working with community because without that, you can't actually get change. So in many ways, injury researchers have been doing co-design and policy informed responses from the beginning, because without that, we can't do anything. So, um, you know, I, you know, I would encourage you to think about where injury sits within within the work that you do, because injury in adolescence is such an important area and it's so underfunded and so under addressed in terms of research. So just coming back to the future, I think recognising the role social determinants play is key to addressing adolescent injury, understanding the interplay of all those factors. And I think often we'll find that addressing social determinants is actually going to reduce injuries without us having a specific targeted injury program. We do want targeted local programs to address injury. They're important. But as we know, self-determination and local ownership is key to delivery of successful programs. But what's most important are policy interventions, system level interventions that tackle the social determinants of, of, of health. That's critical. So that's all I've got. I think we can go over to questions now. Um, I think um, hopefully if you're interested, come back to me at some other time. I'm very happy to talk to people um, if anyone's interested in engaging in injury. And I will hand over to Kate now and we might cut to some questions. Thanks very much. It's been lovely to speak to you all. Um, uh, great to have the opportunity. Rebecca, thank you really for a fantastic presentation. I'm still a black square because my computer is not letting me appear again. Um, but I can, I can still ask you the questions. It just feels a bit disembodied, I think. Um, so apologies for that. I can't really work out what to do. Uh, hasn't happened before. So let's start off with, we have some pretty heavy questions. Um, and I'm going to start with, um, the, I, I think it was Rachel who early on asked, what's the reason for the difference by gender? Um, is it social influence? Um, gender normative behaviour, biological or developmental? And is there research exploring this? So I'd love you to perhaps expand on that. Look, I think, Kate, it's such a tricky question, as you know. Um, I, I don't actually have an easy answer to that. Um, I think we, we, we often question it, um, you know, whether there's a biological underpinning of that. And I think, you know, from the Archer study, it hasn't given us any great sort of answers to that about whether there really are any differences there. Mm. What, what, I mean, I think it's likely to be gender normative behaviour um, and, 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 and us basically having expectations of the way in which people behave and that leads to risk-taking behaviour, um, peer pressure and so on. Um, I, I don't I don't really have anything that's more sophisticated an answer than that. Um, but it's so consistent across the globe, across every type of injury. Um, so I mean it's 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 really is quite a stark difference between male and female. Next question comes from Daniel and um, he, again interested in have there been any changes in injury trend, trends by gender? And 
I assume that sports injuries are likely to increase with increase in female sports participation, go the Matildas. And I'm wondering if there may be any other areas where this may occur, e.g. Mo motorcycle injuries. So, um, again, on that issue of gender. And yeah, I, I think it's, a, again, good question. And I think as we see increased exposure, we're going to see increased injuries but the issue is that again we see we still see more um, injuries from males and females because of the way in which they engage in those so for example if you look at road traffic injuries I mean as many young women as men might drive but men tend to have um, more crashes so we've, we've we have actually shown that uh, and this is interesting that young women um, in the drive study there were more um, hospitalized um, injuries for women than men and one of the reasons why we think that is that cars are designed for male bodies and not female bodies so not that young women are crashing more it's just that when they are in a crash they're more likely to injured because of the geometry of the car which is better actually suited for a man than a woman and that's to do with the way in which we design cars mm. so I mean it, it is it's a kind of nuanced issue um, we do see um, we do see injuries will increase with increased female sports participation um, absolutely but again um, even if you look at the football codes, you might ask questions about with the same level of exposure, are men more likely to be injured because they play football in a different way? Are they rougher? Are mm -hmm. they engaging in heavier duty tackles than women? Mm -hmm. um, is there a way in which gender differences in the way people actually play sport? And that's not clear at this point um, in time. Um, so I think you've got to differentiate between, you know, you've got increased exposure, which will lead to increase, but we're still seeing increases in males compared to females, even with similar exposure. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. That's really uh, food for thought. Um, and coming to Jen Jennifer's question next, um, her question is, there associate you described some associations between not and having uh, a um, driver licensing program and economic and educational outcomes and she was wondering is there a lot of understanding around directions of these associations because you you certainly were quite careful to say bi-directional uh, look, dri the driver driver licensing and employment and education is not necessarily um, uh, going in one direction. We don't. I mean, when we first did the cross sectional studies, we could see that people who had a driver license were also reported that they were more likely to be educated and to have a job. Um, but who knows? Is it because people had a job that they're more likely to get driver's license and they can overcome the barriers to licensing, or is it the other way around? What we did see with the prospective data from driving change is that when people got their driver's license through the program, they were more likely to have a job or a change in job 12 months later. So we could see some changes, and that's that's work that we're continuing to explore because I think it's important. I think I mean at the end of the day, though, we know that those two things go together. And what you what we what we do know that is particularly if you unskilled if you don't um if you're unskilled um a driver's license is as good as a qualification because it gives you a certificate to drive it gives you op opportunities to go and work for councils jobs where you can drive a truck and other things where you may not actually need other qualifications and so if you've got low levels of literacy and it's mm. it's, it's a it's an issue for people of low income across the country um, and, and that's why supportive programs to help people get through driver licensing is really important or we make sure that there's alternative ways for people to get around. But certainly it's still, I mean, and, you know, for much as I put my hand on my heart and say, I'd love everyone to just ride their bikes and catch public transport around everywhere because it's better for the environment. Mm. Driving is actually essential for many people in the country, particularly people in outer regional areas in big cities um, and in, in country areas. So we're not, we're not quite there yet. Um, so we do need to make sure that uh, licensing is accessible. I'm, I'm someone that has actually done a lot of advocacy though to strengthen graduated driver licensing programs and make it tougher for young people to get a license. And the reason why is that those systems do work. Um, it creates safer drivers. Um, it reduces the death rate in young drivers. And we know that that's devastating. You only need to have heard about a couple of those devastating young crashes that we see so often where you have two or three people killed in a, in a, in a car to understand, um, you know, the trauma that's involved, you know, road traffic injury is a huge issue for young people and graduated driver licensing systems are a really excellent policy response um, to that. But they do mean that 
you know, um, some people are make it, it's much harder for people to get a driver's license. So we need to make sure that we, rather than dumbing down the graduated driver licensing system to make it easy for people, what we need to do is provide supportive programs for everyone to be able to get through, get through the system and to be able to drive safely. Great answer. Um, I'm just coming up through um, the questions. Um, thanks, Rebecca. And this is from Annabelle. In regard to your point about data collection in LGBTQI and in particular gender diverse young people and unintentional injury, has there been any changes made to current or ongoing studies in an attempt to provide a better understanding of this? That's such a great question. Now, like, that's a question, and I think that's something that we should all be feeling responsible for and uncomfortable about because I think there'll be many of us here on this seminar that have not done, haven't taken enough action um, to actually change that. And I think it's something that we all need to actually have in our mind and make sure that we are asking the right questions in our data sets. So there's a couple of things. One is when we're actually doing studies, making sure that we are answering, collecting data in the most appropriate way with the most appropriate questions, that we are working with an, an informed group of people to make sure that our, our questionnaires are designed appropriately, um, but also doing advocacy at government level to make sure that our routinely collected data sets are, are asking the right questions. So I think there is, and we do all have a responsibility to do that. And I, I can say myself, um, I haven't, I haven't, it's nothing that I've done to date. I'm aware that that's something that we should be um, asking questions about in the same way, changing the way in which I work uh, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities has changed over time as I've become um, more reflective about the way that I work as a researcher um, and my role as a supportive person um, in terms of building capacity and training the next generation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researchers. Likewise, um, for gender diverse people, we do need to make sure that we are building and growing research leaders um, and asking asking the right questions and collecting the right sort of data. And I think that's really critically important. And we all need to be reflective um, reflexive, show reflexivity in the way in which we are doing research and understand that, you know, things have to change and we've got a responsibility to contribute to that. No, that's, that's a great message for all who, all our great audience who has been um, with us to the end. Um, we've still got a couple more questions before we run out of time. Um, and there's one from Nicola who said thanks Rebecca great presentation how long do you follow uh, participants with data linkage oh well look that's a million dollar question really isn't it it just depends on um, what the consent was at the beginning and what participants consented to so I mean really it's um, it really just depends um, on on what I mean, if you've got if you're doing data linkage with routinely collected data, that's up to the ethics committee because it's it's not you're not actually asking for participants' consent mm -hmm. uh, for something like um, the drive study. We had open ended um, uh, link uh, consent, but we we are reliant on the ethics committee approving that every time we relink to make sure that it's still ethical. We've come back to um, women in sport. And from Rachel saying that women are more prone to injury due to physical differences um, and hence a reason to restrict women from involvement in more strenuous or aggressive uh, sports. And is this still considered to be the case? Oh God! Well, I mean, what a what a question. I mean, I'll, if I was, I mean, I I'm not a sport injury person, so I'm not going to do anything more than speculate here. So I'll put my hand on my heart and say, do not. I'm not someone that this is not my field. I, I mean, I would say that that's probably a retrograde kind of approach, and I would just say there are, you know, I know that for example there are programs, you know, for for example, uh, young women are more prone to knee injuries, but mm. there are some really great prevention programs which mm. are put in place to make sure that they're not injured. But certainly, wouldn't be restricting women from involvement in more strenuous and aggressive sports. <laughs> so, um, I, if anyone, I'm sure there's other people out there with more expertise, but that would be my uh, my my response to that question. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, sounds discriminatory to me. Um, and uh, also from Shan, um, and I apologise for coming in late, but um, the nuances or differential differences between terms such as self-harm 
and injury or is this addressed in the injury strategic plan and I think that's a great question about the sort of intentional unintentional aspects of injury yeah look I, I mean I look at Sue I talked I, I talked about it a little bit um it's a it's a tricky area but at the end of the day we need some pretty broad brush ways to define injury when we're looking at prevention there's a lot of injury that cuts across both and we're trying to do some untangling of that because mm -hmm. you know injury it's not it's not actually that clear cut we use we use uh you know we use definitions um on intent but actually often you know you might say many unintentional injuries road injuries i you know maybe self-harm or maybe may, you know there's you know you, you think about the relationship in adolescence in particular they're tied up between mental health um, drug and alcohol use risky behaviors um, and then you have to make some kind of decision about whether it's intentional and unintentional so again when we looked at the drive study we actually looked at the self-harm data and we asked people about was it true self-harm and there was a lot of road related self-harm in that so people were saying yes i drove you know we had to go through and code it so well is this true harm or is this just something that's not real self-harm so i think road related self-harm might have been driving um at high speed down the wrong way of a highway now and again you could sort of expect that that's got a high likelihood of death or severe injury so you might say that that's um that's intentional self-harm versus road traffic injury but it's always actually it's a tricky thing for road authorities because they like to try and get as many road deaths off their books as they can so they're you know often quick to actually code things as intentional injury as opposed to unintentional injury but for adolescents in particular it's a bit of a it, you know it's it's fluid, I think, um, and I think we have to understand that. So when we're, again, what I, I think come back to my point about programs that address, I mean, I think we we do need to move away from, you know, siloed programs and look at programs that address the social determinants and, you know, and if you think, look at adolescent injury, cutting across a whole range of different factors um, is, is what's going to be important. I think that's a, a an excellent note to end on and uh, we've run out of time for this webinar. Becca, thank you for a fantastic presentation, lots of food for thought and um, we hope to have you back again sometime to hear uh, about some of your other studies as well. But thank you again for um, coming and talking to us this afternoon. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Thanks everyone for attending. Bye everybody.